My name is Molly McGurr. I am the Events and Programs Manager with Travers Connect. So we're excited to have you all here this morning. Um, and we definitely want to make sure that you have the chance to ask any questions that you may have. So there's a few ways that you're able to do this. Um, the first way is a few people did already submit submit questions over to me and if you did I will make sure I read those at the end. Um, if you did not submit a question and you have one, feel free to use the chat box to go ahead and submit questions that way or if you would like to ask your question live, um, there should be a raise your hand button. So if you click on participants next to your name, uh, I believe it's more, you'll see a raise your hand. That will indicate that you have a question you'd like to ask. Um, at which that point I will call on your name and you can feel free to unmute yourself and turn on your camera to ask that question live. We do just ask that you do save your questions for at the very end when we open up Q&A, um, but we will definitely make sure we have quite a large portion just for that so you are able to ask those questions. So on that note, I would now like to turn it over to Warren Gall. Thanks, Molly. Good morning, everyone. Good morning and welcome to Dr. Herman. Thank you for being with us today. We really appreciate uh, you spending some time with, with the business community here in the Grand Travers area. And thanks to everyone who is uh, joining us this morning and involved. We should mention, and, and we can um, ask this question, we, we do usually record uh, these, uh, these events um, and then we would share them um, on our website if you feel it's appropriate. We don't have to talk about that right now, but certainly we wouldn't post this until we, we um, had permission both from, from the Canada and from the, the TCAPS board of directors. But certainly I think it's something that would be of interest to the local community. So if you are open to that, um, we can discuss that uh, at the end. Uh, thanks again for the opportunity um, from TCAPS to be involved in this process. My name is Warren Call. For your, um, your, for your information, Dr. Herman, our organization, Travers Connect, is the regional uh, economic development organization for the Grand Travers area. We cover a five county region surrounding Traverse City for uh, Chamber of Commerce functions, as well as economic development functions. We have a, a business support function, much like you'd find at any uh, Chamber of Commerce. We uh, provide expansion services like you would find in most economic development organizations. We have public policy advocacy through both our own organization and our leadership of the Northern Michigan Chamber Alliance, which is a regional group. We provide professional development. And you know, really, as we worked through a strategic planning process last year to, to reorganize our operations, the single biggest thing that we heard from the business community and from our nonprofit employers was the need for talent development. And I, that's why I'm excited to talk with you today and glad you're able to join us. And to put it simply, great businesses need great people. Yeah. And we're very focused internally here on attracting, attracting back and developing homegrown talent. So as you look at some of the fantastic programs that our public school system already has, you know, the Cymatech program at TCAPS, the TBA ISD Career Tech Center. We're very proud of those. They are directly related to our ability to develop talent, but also looking at the broader spectrum, uh, some fantastic arts education that takes place in the district is uh, a very broad-based skill that creates fantastic uh, employees and, and uh, people in the workforce and, and the education in general. So certainly from our perspective, a strong public schools are central to our talent and business development efforts. And we're doing everything we can to, to support uh, a strong TCAPS and a strong uh, school system uh, here locally. I also think it's important to highlight that uh, strong public schools are also central to our ability to attract businesses and talented people to this area. You know, we want people to move here for the quality of life, obviously for the small town charm and the, and the natural beauty. We want them to move here for great jobs and to start great companies. But I also think it's important to highlight that we want them to move here and stay here because of great schools. Mm -hmm. We hope that, that TCAPS and our other partners in education can be as big of a draw 
from an economic and talent development standpoint as anything else we do. That's really what success looks like to us. So again, thanks for being here and thanks to everyone that's involved today. I will turn it over to Matt Anderson, the uh, treasurer of the TCAP board, to uh, uh, say a few words and introduce Dr. Herman. Thank you. Hey guys, are you there? Can you hear me? My picture just left. We can hear you, Matt. Okay, not sure what happened there, but thanks Warren and uh, Travers Connect for hosting this uh, forum today with our, one of our finalists for the TCAP superintendent position, Dr. Denise Herman. As Warren noted, I'm Matt Anderson and serve as the TCAP's board treasurer. This is my second year volunteering for our school board. We are fortunate to have a strong public school system here in Traverse City. As we look to hire our next superintendent, it's important for all stakeholders to hear from our final candidates and have an opportunity to ask any questions they have. After the Board of Education makes the hiring decision later this week, we will count on our community stakeholders to assist our next superintendent in being successful. Our students, teachers, and staff are relying on us to do our very best. I'm pleased today to introduce Dr. Denise Herman. This is Dr. Herman's 30th year in education and 20th year in school administration. Denise has held several leadership positions, including teacher consultant, department chair, assistant principal, high school principal, associate superintendent, superintendent, school board member, educational consultant, and adjunct instructor for graduate programs. So she's got obviously plenty of experience at all levels. Her leadership traits are typically described as innovative, student-centered, and equity-focused. She is extremely proud of her work to connect students with mental health resources, including site-based wellness centers, social-emotional social learning curriculum, and peer support groups. She gradu graduated with a BS and MS in chemistry and a doctorate in education, administration, and leadership, all from Northern Illinois University in DeKalb, Illinois. She was born and raised in Illinois, lived in Wisconsin for eight years, and spent the last six years in California, and is, and is excited to be returning to the Midwest. So thank you, Dr. Herman, for joining us today. And I guess to start off with, maybe you could start, start off with describing why you're interested in, the, in being the superintendent of TCAPS and why you are best qualified to lead our district. Certainly. Well, thank you for that introduction, Matt. It's nice to see you again. And it's also very nice to see all of the really wonderful faces and people who are interested in the leadership of the school district. Um, recently, um, I made the choice to move back to the Midwest. Um, I had a crisis in my family and it's always been my motto, family first. And so I made the decision that I'm going to explore job opportunities back uh, near the Great Lakes. And one of the things that is very important to me is to find a district that is seeking innovation, that is a medium-sized school district um, between eight and 12,000, I have found is the absolute sweet spot for size because you have enough students and enough revenue flow to be able to offer very high quality opportunities for all students but it's not so big that it starts to feel or become bureaucratic where students or families start to feel that they're a number and not uh, that we're, we're able to treat them with that personal touch. The other thing that attracted me um, was the blueprint and how committed the district is to a blueprint. And the blueprint isn't just your typical strategic plan. It actually has the word reconfigure in it. And I do think that even before the COVID-19 crisis, uh, you had recognized that school education systems do need to be reconfigured and transformed. Um, and I've had uh, the good pleasure of taking on some of those challenges in some of my previous roles from integrating curriculum to um, offering different kinds of assessment and grading practices um, to modifying people's uh, work roles so that they're more aligned with teaching and learning and less with bureaucracy. Um, so to see that there is a district who's already put the hard work in and is seeking a leader who believes in that and who wants to move it forward 
Um, that's very important to me. Finally, in the personal part of it is, um, I really enjoy um, the outdoors and that community. Like you said, it's a, it's, a, it's a thriving economic hub with a small town feel. I'm also a very outdoors person. I run, I hike, I bike, um, and having the opportunity to be a part of a community where others really enjoy that and where that is a celebrated component um, is very important. Um, and it's just a several hour drive to where many of my uh, family is. So it'll be nice to be a drive away and not a flight away in California. Um, so for all of those reasons, um, you know, and uh, it's, it's a very good school district looking at your scores and um, looking at what people, families have to say on all of the uh, school rating um, websites and things like that. People appreciate both the technical components of the school system as well as the arts. And as being a former scientist, that's important to me also. Um, it was important to me as a scientist um, to, I learned during my career early that to be a good science and problem solver, you have to, you have to um, expand your creative mindset. Um, actually, um, I remember receiving um, some feedback from a Nobel Prize winning chemist who came to speak at our university. And he would only come and give his talk on chemical bonding if he would be allowed to read his poetry at a four o'clock poetry session, because it was really important to him to model that really good scientists also stretch themselves creatively. And so that, that really taught me something. And so we had Friday poetry readings in my chemistry class from then on. Um, and so I, I really, I, I consider myself a Renaissance person. I value science, I value arts, I value technology, but I really try to make sure our students see how those things all are interconnected. Uh, thank you very much for that. Um, I, I believe, um, Warren, did we want to have Molly or, or you, did you have the next question, Warren? Uh, certainly, we, we have uh, some questions that we can share, but, but before we do that, uh, we could open it up to, to those of you who have dialed in and see if there's specific questions you'd like to, to touch on or share first. All right. Well, please. Um, I, ha I have one. All right, Liz. Um, so thank you for coming. Um, Hi, Liz. Hi. So I'm, I'm a little unique. I work for Traverse Connect, but I'm also on the TBA ISD school board and have been for many oh. years. So it's so nice to meet you. Um, I, just, a, just a quick question. I've got a couple, but one that um, is near and dear to my heart, which I think it, it might sound resonate a little with Nick as well is could you describe your leadership style mm -hmm. that, that, that's gonna be portrayed not only to the administrator of the board, the public, that kind of thing. How would you describe your style of being a superintendent? Sure. Um, well, again, the, the things in, in the bio that I shared, I think are important in terms to what I value. The idea of equity and innovation are very important to me in terms of things that drive me forward and things that I try to make sure are present in every decision that we make. In terms of my style, I think I see one of my greatest tasks is building leadership capacity in other people. I mean, uh, the TCAPS district is a very large organization. I know from the website, it's the second largest employer in the Traverse City area and um, the, the superintendent, one of my important roles is making sure that all of the people in our organization who are charged with carrying out that vision and strategic plan do so at the optimum level possible. And so I, I pride myself on having very excellent coaching skills. I also pride myself on being a hands-on person, so I'm very present. I attend many events. Um, I also make sure that um, I'm building relationships with people. So for example, at school sites, I make sure that I not only visit principals on their sites, but I also visit classrooms. Um, I have lunches with the staff to make sure they can come in with no agenda. The agenda is theirs. Because I think that's when people start to feel that they 
can get to know you personally is when they start to build bridges and trust you professionally. Um, that's when we start to reach a synergy where we have that foundation of relationship and trust um, and going into some pretty challenging times, I'm going to need to do that fairly quickly um, because unfortunately, um, wh whomever you choose is going to have some very difficult decisions about budget. Um, and as in, is every superintendent across the United States, it's going to be in that same boat of pretty significantly reduced revenue um, with still very high expectations about what our students need, if not higher expectations for what they need during this distance learning or blended learning or whatever we're going to be able to open up in the fall. Um, so I think that idea of relationship-based, trust-based, and I do those through face-to-face -face interactions. I would rather go to a school site or attend a chamber luncheon than simply respond to an email. Um, I think some other things, when I talk about equity-based, I also, that's not just in, um, you know, looking at achievement gap or things like that. I really look for opportunities for underrepresented groups to shine. Um, being a female scientist, you know, I was one of, I was only four people out of 40 in my graduate program in chemistry. Um, and so I think some of those uh, early opportunities taught me that that's, that's part of my job too, is to find ways to help people who maybe aren't always in the spotlight to get a little bit of that spotlight and to help them build their confidence and their capacity. Um, going back to what the person who spoke earlier about talent development, I think that um, it, probably a lot more talent than what we typically recognize with some of our traditional ways of thinking about talent development um, and that um, I think with, with the current situation with staying at home and, and some of these other things, we're recognizing skills that people have that we didn't maybe recognize when we were in such our fast paced world of, you know, working 12 hour days and things like that. So um, I guess I'm a people person. Um, I, I took this online quiz where it talked about me being an extroverted introvert. So when I need to, I can put myself out there. I can you know, give a, a very thoughtful talk to people who are interested in learning about a school system or learning about a policy change that we're making. Um, but I also really know that there's an opportunity for me to be behind the scenes and let my staff shine, let my principal shine. Um, and I really try to do my best to navigate those situations as well. Perfect. Thank you. I, I do see a question coming in from Dr. Nick Siglerick. So Nick, would you like to go ahead and ask your question as well? Thanks, Molly. Uh, thanks, Dr. Herman. It's, um, I want to give a kudos to the TCAPS board for um, the high quality and level of candidates. Both, um, both candidates have demonstrated uh, excellence in their respective roles, uh, and it's exciting, uh, and it's a, an exciting time. So, um, uh, my question, Dr. Herman, is uh, while I recognize that we probably have more in common uh, than, um, uh, than not alike, there are some nuances to um, uh, Michigan's uh, public school systems, whether they're in finance um, and or in the political arena. And so not having that experience, um, what ways would you find yourself trying to um, be brought up to speed and connect um, so that you could have a really great understanding of, of uh, finances in Michigan as well as how schools are run? Right. Um, well, I, I couldn't agree more that I know um, the other gentleman who's a finalist is a, a Michigan native and he definitely has that advantage of having a, of currently having a deep understanding of the finances, especially during this time. But one of the things that I would bring is some different perspectives because we're going to be needing some out of the box thinking as we're approaching pretty these subst substantial cuts. Um, one of the things that um, I have the experience of doing is moving from one state to another. I, I was a leader in Wisconsin and served eight years as a high school principal there. And um, that's when we went through the Act 10 and all of the unions were busted and some very, very tumultuous times. 
um, with some budget implications as well as personnel um, issues to, to work through. So I have that experience under my belt. Um, and then uh, when the opportunity arose, uh, my husband and I uh, did transition to California. And so I, I have transitioned from one state to another and very rapidly learned the differences and there are some significant differences. Um, the systems are the things that's different. Teaching and learning, they're, they're good teaching and learning is the same anywhere. Students and their needs are very, very similar from state to state. Um, you know, they, they, they need to be connected and they need to have engaging curriculum and they need authentic feedback. All of those things are universal. Um, but how the schools are funded, um, how, so for example, Cap, uh, California is very uh, largely funded on capital gains taxes. So the very uh, sharp decrease that we've seen in uh, those is going to have a significant hit. Um, over this last week, we've learned that it's going to be approximately 10 to $12 billion will be the cut across the state of California. And that could be anywhere between 10 to 20 percent of the revenue that comes per pupil to each site. Um, so I, I, I guess because I've had experiences um, understanding budgeting and um, uh, I, I think that we have a really good team. I was able to meet with the uh, cabinet and with the uh, finance person and the others. Um, so I, I am very um, open to relying on the internal experts as well as the outgoing interim superintendent. I know from talking with the search firm person, Mr. Morse, that he's very willing to um, assist myself or, or the other gentleman who's a finalist in, in that transition um, because some of the decisions are going to need to be made, you know, before July 1, before we would officially start. And so um, I would also be interested in trying to make early connections um, and having some maybe early transition days to sit with the cabinet, with the board during the month of June and um, really start rolling up our sleeves and looking at options and uh, making those decisions together. Uh, thank you, and, and clearly you've demonstrated uh, the capacity to do that and to learn very quickly. And, and I would just offer, um, you know, as an intermediate school district, we serve our local districts and uh, we have resources as well. And, and in terms of um, uh, anything that we can do to support your transition, should you be the candidate, uh, letting the board know as well as you, we're, we're here as a support and to help. And, you, you're exactly right. Jim Pavelka is is someone, that, someone I, that I would rely on as well. Yes, He's definitely uh, someone that uh, knows the community and has a great experiences and has done a great job. So thank you for your response. Warren, I wonder if I could just ask a quick question, uh, and I apologize if there weren't perhaps uh, introductions were made, but I'm Andy Page. I'm the uh, president and CEO of the Grand Traverse Bay YMCA here in Traverse City, um, and. Thank you very much uh, for your participation in this process. Um, in light of everything that's going on right now, um, the one question I would ask you is where do you stand as far as children going back to school in the fall? Mm -hmm. uh, obviously there's a lot of um, mandates that may be forthcoming and data and that sort of thing, but I, I guess just more intrinsically from your perspective, what are, you, what are your thoughts on that, uh, knowing what we, you know, the information that we've gleaned with, uh, I'm not sure about California, but yeah. March, obviously our school ended and it never reconvened. So um, just interested in what your thoughts are on that. Absolutely. Um, one of the things that's important for any and it is to think about, about um, sorry, there's a little bit, a little bit um, to think about, think about student safety. Student safety part. Part. Students have, will have a difficult time learning if they are in fear the that they might be sick or if they're sick, sick or something like that. So I think that the job is going to be to find that healthy balance, meaning, um, all of the information we know from the medical profession and all of the information that we know from um, the data and what we're able to do to keep students safe. Uh, my goal would be to get some face-to-face -face instruction occurring. I think that um, one of the things that I, uh, 
I pride myself on is the idea of working hard to integrate social and emotional learning. And students really thrive when they're able to make connections with each other, with their teachers. Um, and so I would wanting over the summer to be working with cabinet and principals and teacher leaders to put together a plan where we could easily pivot. Um, I don't know, again, based on the criteria that um, uh, Michigan has, what is the threshold for being able to open 100% full time in California, the California Department of Education is still working on those criteria. Um, what will be the criteria for 100% face to face, and then what will trigger needing to go um, to um, uh, distance learning should we have another um, relapse into um, a, a, a pandemic spread. Um, but one of the things that we are already looking at is trying to um, reduce the number of students who are on campus any one time. The model that's, um, uh, I would say, with our principals and teachers leading the way would be alternate day. So you would have half of your class on one day, half of your class on the other, um, with some distance learning options for students in between on those days. Um, I, I think that um, that that could be one of the models that we would need for that interim. So if, if we're able to start with face-to-face -face instruction based on health data, if we needed to pivot to that, then we would have very clear protocols in place for staff and for families on what that's gonna look like. And then again, should we have to go into a much more substantial kind of shelter at home like we are now, we would be able to pivot to some of the strategies we're using now. Um, so I, I definitely see summer as uh, multi-tiered planning for us with the goal is to have student contact with their peers and student contact with a parent as something that I think would enhance their overall learning, enhance their overall development, um, but again not to do so if it would put either staff or students uh, health in danger. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Molly, is it okay if I jump in? Um, just one second. We do have another question from Trevor, and then Whitney, you can go after Trevor. So Trevor, go ahead and ask your question. Yeah, that's right. I'll go first. Hi, I'm Trevor Takach. I'm the president and CEO of Traverse City Tourism, the Convention and Visitors Bureau. Hi, Hi Trevor. Dr. Herman, thank you for taking the time to meet with us today. Um, kind of playing off Andy's question, digging a little bit deeper. <laughs> pandemic or no pandemic, when it comes to things like balanced calendar um, or year-round schooling, uh, knowing our region and how seasonal we are, still kind of agrarian, still very dependent on hospitality and families who are very interested in taking advantage of the great outdoors as you like to do. Mm -hmm. uh, over time, um, how do you see that um, working in our state and specifically in the Travers region? Uh, and then how does technology play into that? So kind of expanding on the answer you just gave. Mm -hmm. before, mm -hmm. more vision on it. Sure. Um, and growing up in Illinois and Wisconsin, knowing the agrarian, um, we have a fifth, now sixth generation family farm. So um, I, I do understand, uh, although we have grain, not fruit trees and grapes and things like that, like your area. Um, and I also spent time in Wisconsin, which is also a very tourist based state in terms of its school calendar. It still is a, you can't start before um, Labor Day and things like that. So I definitely understand when a state is committed to supporting its tourism industry. Um, and finally, my daughter got her degree in hospitality, tourism, and management. So um, yeah, absolutely, yeah, she, she went to Purdue and she really enjoyed her time there. So I, I have an appreciation for um, how um, nuanced that industry can be and, and, and the role that having your workforce be stable and be available is. Um, I think one of the things that we've seen with the pandemic is that um, if we were to need to go to some sort of learning that would happen over the summer, um, I would want to work a lot with your um, industry as well as um, with the families to decide what could that look like. 
I know that um, it's not common in, in the Midwest necessarily, but there are some areas in the country who have both high tourism and have looked at some alternate calendars. Colorado, because of their fast expansion in the early 2000s, some of those communities did go to year-round school um, and learned and made a lot of mistakes and then figured out how to do it right. Um, and so I would be looking for models in other areas who had similar kinds of challenges um, and to, to learn from them first and see if any of those strategies could be used in the Traverse area. Um, I also think that um, one of the ideas of um, partnering so that technology could be used um, that the nice thing about technology and that kind of education, at least for our older students who then are also the ones who work, is that that could be asynchronous, meaning if they have a part time job, you know, working at one of the as a lifeguard at the beach or something like that, um, which I did in high school also, I was a lifeguard at a beach, um, that they could not have to be in school from 8 a.m. till 3 p.m. Um, they could have a lighter load and it would be flexible so that they still could meet some of their work obligations to keep the industry moving forward. Um, that summer would be the absolute maximum time to highlight the asynchronous courses so it could work around student work schedules um, and um, more in the uh, fall, winter, and spring where there, the tourism industry is not as demanding as where we would probably put more of the classes that require synchronous, meaning specific time to gather any lab-based classes or things like that where they did need to have that side-by-side -side time with their teacher or peers. So I think some of those kinds of nuanced planning and decision-making could be put into place. Um, but it is, it's, it's going to require some creative thinking. That's, that's what I can come up with off the top of my head right now. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Whitney, would you like to go ahead next? Thanks, Molly. Um, I also work with Trevor, so uh, and have worked in the past with the Trust Connect. So I am uh, Whitney Wara. I have three kiddos that are all at uh, the Montessori school in town, the uh -huh. Teacup Montessori. Um, I, I guess my question, and I think everybody on this call um, will probably nod their heads when I say, our community is really um, unique in a lot of ways. And I know everyone says, oh, ours, ours is special, but really we have a <laughs> pretty engaged um, region, um, some really strongly held opinions in our region. Mm -hmm. um, those, they're not always the same opinions. And this is a really public position. And I think um, one, of the, one of the opportunities and challenges is, is um, in trying to walk that delicate balance to um, please folks and at the same time ensure that you're putting in the best practices you can and um, really trying to ensure the best for our students' education. Mm -hmm. So what about the Traverse City community excites you? Are there things that worry you mm -hmm. or that you're, you have some concerns about? And again, how would you ensure that you're making balanced decisions between those strongly held community um, voices that might be coming at you and your knowledge of the industry and what we should be doing? Well, that's first of all, congratulations on being a um, uh, parent teacher. I'm sure that you are working hard to keep your kids learning moving forward. Um, in terms of what attracts me to the TCAPS school district and the Traverse City area, um, I really appreciate communities that have diverse opinions. Um, moving to, from uh, the suburbs of Chicago to um, the Madison area, that was a purposeful choice. I like being in communities where there's diverse opinions. Um, that's the state capital. And so many of the legislatures either have homes there or spend time there. Um, and it also, Wisconsin being a purple state, um, very diverse thinking and community efforts. 
And so um, I, I appreciate that. I appreciate when not everybody, um, uh, I think you get better solutions to most problems when you've thought about it from multiple perspectives. And so I do think that's one of the jobs of a superintendent is to be a very strong communicator um, because uh, your job isn't just to project what you think is maybe what research says should be done. I do think that's a very important role, but I think equally as important is listening and paraphrasing back some of the fears or concerns that a portion of the community might have about that. Um, I think finally, once you've done that process for any given issue or decision that would be before, um, the, the community and the school board are the ones who are entrusted to make the final decisions about what education looks like in, in their community. And it's my job as the leader and the person who is trying to hold up the mirror and say, here's what we know about student learning. Here's what we know about our budget. Here's the best recommendation. So it will always be my job and working with my cabinet to make the absolute best recommendations based on what we know about how kids learn, based on what we know about school finance, um, and based on what we know is aligned with the values of the community. Um, and then it's my job to work with the board to help them make the best decision and then implement it. Um, and I think most of the time that ends up being what the cabinet recommended. And I know sometimes it isn't. Um, and that's my job then is to say, okay, um, I think that this decision maybe could have gone a different direction, but right now where we are as a community, we need to fully implement this. This has been the decision. And so um, I've had experience working through those situations too, where the needs of the community and what they were hoping for um, didn't align necessarily with what our recommendation was as mine as a superintendent and my cabinets. Um, I did my absolute best to diplomatically advocate. Um, that wasn't how it happened. That next day I was there ready to roll up my sleeves and implement so that um, the decision would be as um, implemented to the fullest extent to still be good for kids. Um, so I, I do think the role of the superintendent is to advocate for what's, what's best for student learning. Um, and um, I also, again, being in education for 30 years, I know that that's, there's not one right answer to that. Um, there can be different ways that we can approach delivering instruction or assessing student learning that can get to some of the same outcomes, but look and feel a little differently. So one of the other things that I'm a, a big advocate of is um, having choice in some of the how that we get there, not the actual outcome. So if, if, if the choice means that some students get more and other students get less, then that's not a choice that I think is one that I would want us to explore. But if the choice in any educational decision is that there's two different paths, but they end up with students getting to the same learning outcomes, I think that's also something that can help people feel more connected to a decision is when you're really willing to explore when those opportunities are there, that you're open-minded to explore those opportunities. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Thank you. It looks like we have a question coming in from Kevin Klein. So Kevin, you can go ahead and uh, unmute yourself. Hi, I'm Kevin Klein. I'm the airport director here at Cherry Capital Airport. Um, I've had three children in the TCAPS um, uh, programs. Uh, we're over on the west side of town with West Woods, West Middle School, and then West Senior High. Um, Programs. One of the reasons I'm wearing my sweatshirt today mm -hmm. is the tennis program. We went to the state Congratulations. Uh, championship <laughs> years ago. It's about programs. Um, uh, and also, I give a little background uh, mm -hmm. family of teachers. My mom was a chemistry teacher. Oh, wonderful. So, um, very familiar with your process and, mm -hmm. and uh, some of the challenges you may have faced. So, um, it's about programs, though, as we face these challenging times, whether it's the pandemic or another crisis that may come forward, programs, administration, um, 
and it all centers around financial stability and cuts. So when you have to prioritize those things, I one of my children has a 504 plan uh, with diet restrictions and other things. So things that are priorities to maybe one family may not be a priority to another family. So when we talk about school nurses or school administrators, mm -hmm. um, you have to make some challenging decisions on where to cut to balance these financial times. What's your process that you go through? Mm -hmm. What's your decision-making tree? And you know, where do you tend to, to center that energy so that we don't lose out on programs for special needs right. or people that have medical situations? Right. Uh, thank you for that really thoughtful question. Um, my, uh, my daughter um, was, uh, she has albinism and she was, uh, had low vision. And so she had a IEP going through school from when she was six months old uh, until she was in college. So I also, as a parent, navigated um, the part of education where additional support is given to some students. And the reason she thrived and was able to go to university is because the school made those services available to her. And not only is that the right thing to do, but it's the law. And so my number one thing when it comes to um, deciding about programs and um, uh, you know, making sure that all students get not only what they need, but what they legally deserve is that we follow the law. And not every school district does that. They find some ways to shortchange some of the 504 services or shortchange some of the special education services. Um, and that's not, um, that's not okay on my watch. Um, like I said, when I, when I think about equity, it's not just achievement gap equity and um, equity by race or ethnicity. It's also any other group that needs additional protection. So students with IEPs, 504s, students with any other social emotional kind of uh, needs. Um, so that's, that's my number one decision making tree um, is we, we need to follow the law. After that, then we need to look to other things that we've already invested a lot of time and energy in, which would be the strategic plan. The community has spent the last two years putting down what it values in, in writing. We, we have that tool. And so it's my job to help the district, the board, and the community interpret that now. Um, so you, you really are in a much better place than other communities who haven't recently done that work. Um, because when you're in a crisis, your emotions get high. And then you start, I mean, I, I know that we all do that. That's human nature. And so how it, it's, I, I consider it a luxury that we have this document that said, no, here's our priorities. We have these in writing. Now we're in this crisis. How are we going to take this blueprint and use it to help us make some of these decisions? Um, you know, the mission is to educate that all students thrive. You know, everyone thrives in a community when students are well educated. Um, and I think education is not just academic education. I do think that's our primary mission, but I don't, I don't think that that means cutting the arts. I don't think that at all. I think that from everything I've read and seen, the community thinks educating students is educating people in all facets of, of their life. So when it comes to making program cuts, um, we would need to look at um, things that would be more on the periphery that are nice to have and um, or um, uh, are, I would say, secondary or tertiary supports um, of learning. So for example, um, your tennis sweatshirt, um, we might not be able to have three or four different levels of tennis. You know, we, we might be able to have um, uh, one competitive tennis team and then we have intramurals and we ask for community volunteers to come in and help supervise some of those kinds of things. So I think it's going to require some creative problem solving. Um, but what I've seen already during this crisis, that's when people rise to, um, to, to what a community needs. Um, and so I, I would be looking with people in the re retirement area to say, okay, you know, again, what we can do social distance wise. So if we are able to have sports again, when we are, I, I would hope that we would find ways to continue to offer opportunities for students 
Some students thrive, they're kinesthetic learners, they need to use their bodies. Um, other kids need to express themselves in art and some students just love reading and they need all the books they can get their hands on. Um, so I'd wanna make sure that we make those things available. It's going to be maybe in less expensive options. It might be in, in reduced scope. Um, but again, my main job is to not come in and make those decisions in isolation. My main job is to make sure that we have this blueprint and I'm facilitating processes for the board and the community to look at recommendations and then to, to make, unfortunately, what is going to be painful. Um, but again, that's my job is to communicate. There's no perfect solution. Our job is going to be to make the best solution we can given the resources and the situation we're in. Thank you, I appreciate that. Mm -hmm. We do have another question um, from Liz McCuller. So Liz, would you like to turn off your, or turn on your microphone and ask that? Thank you for indulging me again. Um, I just had a question on, because of being on the board, I'd love it if you would, if you could articulate clearly what you feel the role of the board is and the role of the superintendent. Right. Um, well, I, that's a really good question. Um, we're one of the only um, industries, education, where um, you know the, the board is made up of people who don't have necessarily training in, in the industry that they're helping to oversee. Um, but I know just from being my history of education, but that was really purposeful because the founding fathers thought that education really is an investment in the community in its future. And so that's how I really look at um, the role of the school board. They're representing the community and making sure that the big picture decisions, hiring the superintendent, setting policy, making major financial decisions, those are things that are entrusted to the school board as uh, representatives of the voice of everyone who lives in that community because it is taxpayer dollars that we're using to fund education. What I see is the role of the superintendent is then implementing all of those policies, hiring everyone else and supervising everyone else. The, the board has one employee and that's the superintendent. And, um, and from that relationship, the superintendent then oversees implementation of everything. Um, I, I have seen in the past where sometime when there's role confusion, where the school board thinks that they might supervise certain, you know, they have a very strong opinion on maybe an athletic coach or how a certain principal is doing at a site. And I think it's good to listen to that feedback from a school board because again, they, they are members of the community, um, but that, that feedback comes to me and other members of cabinet, and then we use our professional training and our management tools to work to solve the problem uh, as a day-to-day -day problem. So day-to-day -day issues, um, any kind of um, hiring, firing, all of those kinds of personnel issues in general um, are the purview of the, superintendent and cabinet. Um, all of the things that are setting the course for the future, for example, the strategic plan document was approved by the board. Um, the major budget, the annual budget, and making sure then that monthly expenditures are underneath what we've said they are. So, you know, I think sometimes people get confused that the, the board is micromanaging and looking at the, you know, day-to-day -day expenses. And I say, no. You know, when, when all of that comes to the board, they've given direction, and that's just part of the checks and balances for those things to come to the board regularly to say, okay, yep, we said we wanted 12% of our budget to go towards, you know, um, transportation, and let's make sure that we're sticking to that. And so um, I think that um, having a really healthy attitude about the relationship between a school board and its superintendent um, you have to view yourself as a governance team where I represent the professionals and the day-to-day -day work and, um, you know, rolling up our sleeves and um, doing the best we can to educate our students. And the school board members represent the community and the community's needs 
and the accountability part of using our tax dollars to the best of our overall ability. Great, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. We did have a few questions come in from Beth. Beth, would you like to go ahead? The sun came out here while you're talking. I'm going to swip my... <laughs> oh, yeah, no problem. There we go. That's better. Sorry. Um, Beth, I'm not sure if she is going to ask them live or not. Beth, would you like to go ahead and ask those live? Um, so I'm not able to see them at the moment. So I'm in my car. I'm not driving, but I had to, I had to go to an appointment. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. So I can go ahead and read those off for you if you just want to introduce yourself. Sure. So Dr. Herman, thank you so much for doing this and, um, and for your candidacy. Um, I know I'm among many who were really excited to, to see, uh, to watch your interview, hear what you had to say and see you come through as a candidate. And yeah, I gave some thought to, to some questions. And like I said, I, I had to make it to an appointment and I don't have them in front of me, but Molly does. So okay. I'm going to let her ask them on my behalf, but thank you. Thank you so much for participating this morning. So right. there is two questions. I'll go ahead with the first one. Um, TCAPS has faced some challenges in how parents felt treated by administration. When it comes to K-12 education, do you believe there is a place for customer service? In your past leadership positions, what exceptions and systems have you put in place to, su to support positive relationships with parents? Um, absolutely. I think that um, we are a people business and I think any people business needs to be very conscious of the quality of service that it's giving first to students and second to parents and then third to the community. Um, and, but I also have a very open mind about um, the interactions and sometimes the um, miscommunication that can happen between uh, staff members and um, parents or community members. Um, one of my uh, strengths is I, I was very fortunate <clears throat> to participate in some quality uh, cognitive coaching training, which is really using structured conversation skills to help people solve their own problems, if you want to think of it that way, um, through paraphrasing, asking good questions, helping people be able to take other people's perspectives. Um, and so that's one of the strategies that I use sometimes when a complaint um, about a teacher or a principal or something makes its way to a uh, district office. Um, I always try to make sure that um, We've tried to solve the problem along the way, but I've also learned that if the problem is miscommunication between the principal and a parent, they're not going to be able to solve their own problem. <laughs> um, and so sometimes people try to send it back and say, no, I want this solved at the site level. Sometimes that's really not the appropriate path to take. Um, so I try to make sure that we have very clear protocols on ways to a first try to solve that problem at the site level. But when that can't happen, there needs to be opportunities for um, parents to have support from district office and navigating our, either solving the problem or getting the communication back on track. Um, for example, um, in my current district, um, we had some issues with um, some staff members not necessarily from site principals not taking some of the concerns of parents seriously about the conduct of a teacher. Um, and um, unfortunately, there was some misconduct happening. And um, we needed to make sure that we did um, more, much more significant training of our principals on understanding um, gender bias and some things like that to make sure that that didn't happen again. That didn't mean that the person who didn't recognize that or didn't act on it um, was a bad principal. It meant that they were operating under some outdated ways of thinking about interactions between students and principals. And my very first job is to make sure that we found the root cause of the problem, named it, and then said this has to stop. 
Um, I then immediately went into training mode with our attorneys and with other training um, uh, work groups and consultants. And we made sure that it became a systemic process. We updated our policies to make sure that if students or parents had complaints about teacher conduct or administrator conduct, that we um, made that path to problem solving very clear. Um, we also made sure that administrators knew how to better document parent concerns and student discipline incidents um, so that we had a much clearer record of when things were first reported, when things, um, what kind of action we took initially. Um, so, I mean, it's, it's never fun to have to deal with situations around um, parent complaints that are, are founded. Um, but when that happens, I have very clear um, expectations that we don't sweep them under the rug, that we put very clear protocols in place to make sure that they're not repeated and that, again, student safety is, is primary. I also have experience, however, um, helping to navigate situations where sometimes the, the things that parents are asking of principals or of teachers is not appropriate. Um, I've had a recent experience where we opened up a brand new pool and a group of parents very much wanted to have 90% of the pool time for their club water polo team. <laughs> and they were very strong advocates. Um, and I met with those parents and I listened to their concerns. And then I also talked about, while I understood that they were very major advocates in that referendum passing to build the pool, that the pool was um, you know, property of a school district and that it needed to be open equitably to all user groups. Um, so I also have experience um, doing very thoughtful listening and then being that person who um, is okay having the dialogue with parents when we have to say, no, I'm sorry, we aren't going to be able to meet that request, but here's why. Um, so I, I guess I look at interactions with parents if they have a complaint as an opportunity for them to give us feedback on how we're doing. And if there's a problem, we solve it. And if we aren't able to meet their needs, we very diplomatically let them know why. Perfect. And the next question was not to be confused with systems, i.e. the blueprints at TCAPS, a compelling vision with big goals and TCAPS future could inspire all stakeholders and attract community benefactors. How would you lead visioning for the district and what happens once a vision and goals are defined? Mm -hmm. um, well, I the, the question is a little confusing to me because um, from, what, from what I've read, and again, this is unfortunately, I can't be there in person to talk with staff members, but from reading um, some of the things that are available to me online about the blueprint, um, it does have priorities and it does have some components of a vision, but what I'm hearing in the question is that a lot of people who maybe aren't in education need it to be much more clear and much more tangible. So one of the things that I think um, an organization can do to make that happen is to try and, I mean, it, it sometimes sounds cliche, but to actually make images of the vision of what it would look like. Um, I had the good fortune when I was in St. Charles, Illinois, that was the former headquarters way back when, when Arthur Anderson, when it was still called Arthur Anderson, their headquarters were there. And they facilitated um, the strategic planning process for our school district. And so I feel like we had, you know, Cadillac um, strategic planning experiences from working with their consultants. And one of the things they had us do was not only verbally describe what the vision would be like, you know, especially in terms of technology, this was in the late nineties, but thinking about every student having a technology device and what might might be able to access. Um, they put together for each of the strands of our vision, we had those descriptors, um, one of their um, on-staff artists turned into images. And having an image next to the text brought it to life for so many stakeholder groups. Um, 
It also helped um, people see examples. So it could help us, let's say, oh, well, we would need, um, for example, for the technology one, well, we would need, you know, back then before um, other things like that, it was just even getting um, devices in computer labs, not even everyone having that. So what would be our vision about the number of computer labs? What would we want? What would um, some of those things be? Because as it becomes more tangible, it allows people in the community to say, oh, I now see how if I make this donation or if I work and volunteer so that A, B, or C can happen, it's now connected to this larger blueprint. Um, so I do think that that is part of the job of um, the superintendent and the assistant superintendents is drilling down from this blueprint to the goals, to a vision of what it could look like in one, three, and five years so that people who want to participate and want to offer up either their services or their resources can do so and see it in a tangible way. Um, I sometimes liken it to, um, I'm a big advocate of the United Way. And um, when I make my donation, one of the things that I really appreciate is that you can make a general donation or you can make a donation that's directed at a specific initiative that they have. Um, and so I think that would be an example of what I'm describing is um, we have this uh, blueprint, we have these vision things, and then um, some of the resources needed to implement that would be described and people could then um, uh, donate time or resources, or we could write grants that are targeting some of those things because again, the clearer plan you have and the clearer vision you have, the better your chances of winning grant dollars and other external resources are. Um, so I, I do think that's an important part of um, trying to secure resources beyond taxpayer dollars. It has to be a compelling story and it has to be um, opportunities for people to be a part of it in very small ways. So someone who has a very modest income has an opportunity to feel they're a part of it, as well as people who are financially able to make significant contributions or have a lot of time to donate they see places where when they make a donation, it is going to impact kids. Perfect. I, I do want to be respectful of your time. Um, we did have a few questions left, but it is noon. Are you able to take two more questions or? I, I will definitely take two more questions, sure. Okay, all right. I just wanted to make sure, and for anyone else, if you do have to come off, um, we understand, but we will just ask these last two questions here. So um, the next question is, in the area in the era of declining budgets, scarcity of colleges graduating certified teachers and virtual learning by demand, what can we as the business community do to assist the educational support here at TCAPS? Um, well, I think that some of the things that I see you doing already online um, in terms of celebrating the connection that you have between the business community and the um, education opportunities. Um, I know that um, when my husband and I were always thinking about relocating, the schools were the number one thing that made our decision. Um, and so I think that um, strength, continuing to strengthen that partnership between the schools and the business community and the local government um, one of the other things, and I know right now, um, uh, I'm, I'm talking with Travers Connect, but I think also having a partnership with the um, uh, local government, the park districts, the police, um, you know, we have um, uh, police liaison officers in every one of our high schools. Those are all bridges that really are invaluable between different um, taxpayer funded um, uh, agencies coming together to jointly serve students. So I think really celebrating those, um, if, if those are in place, valuing those, if those aren't in place, exploring additional opportunities for those. Um, you know, for example, um, we partnered several years ago here in Roseville with um, the um, Placer County Tourism and with the city and the school district to build an Olympic-sized pool that's now 
We use it for um, our own sports teams and for swim classes, but over the summer and almost every weekend, it's being used as a competitive um, uh, competition space for club swim and water polo and things like that. And it's been a wonderful investment for everyone who has participated. It has given back tenfold to our community. So I, I think looking for opportunities like that um, is very important. Um, and then I also think that, um, you know, um, the idea of growing, growing our own and making sure that students who are coming up through the K-12 system have opportunities to participate through internships, through um, other kinds of job shadows and things like that, so that they see the, um, the vibrancy of the workforce in the area. Um, I think sometimes teens you know, want to be anywhere but where they are home. <laughs> and that's, that's a natural tendency. But I think that us showcasing for them um, opportunities that are local, even if they do, you know, go off to college, um, there is that pull back to being um, by their family or knowing that it's just a very safe and welcoming um, uh, place that they might want to raise their family. Um, so again, I think it's um, making sure that people feel connected who are already there and opening up and, you know, making sure that any families new to the community, that we work together with businesses and the schools and the local government um, to make them feel like that's a place they want to stay. Wonderful. Um, the last question we have here is, what are the first three things that you are going to do if hired? Mm. Well, with social distancing, the answer is different. Um, if, if, it wasn't, um, if it wasn't that, I would say, um, um, you know, do a lot of things to mingle in the community, I think, making connections, but I, but I won't be able to do that, unfortunately. Um, so I guess one of the things that I would do would be meet with the outgoing superintendent. Um, I know he has a rich history in the district um, and has his pulse on not only the politics, the budget, um, and how the um, you know, insides of the organization are working, what is working really well and what might need immediate attention. So I do think really maximizing that partnership and that relationship um, would be number one. Number two, would be really um, getting to know the school board, having one-on-one -on -one meetings with each school board member, um, again, as that's allowed, um, working to make sure that we do some sort of retreat or team builder so that I am very clear on their expectations of me as a superintendent and that I'm able to communicate what I need from them in return so that I can be the best um, leader for the school district um, because I think that that partnership needs to be very strong to sustain itself over the challenges that we're going to be facing in the future. Um, and then third, I think um, putting together some sort of input sessions for the community, for teachers, for other staff members, because we are going to be faced with making some pretty substantial decisions about budget in the very near future. And so the third thing I would do would be to put together some sort of opportunity to create some options for places for budget cuts to do some sort of t virtual town hall, real town hall, ways to educate people, and then to get some decisions. Because I think sometimes we seek input from the community members um, without taking the time to educate them on the pros and cons of some of the different models and so we end up getting skewed feedback or feedback that's maybe more from fear or presumptions rather than what could be possible moving forward. So I think that would be a really important part would be to put together thoughtful models, educate people about those models, and then seek their input for decisions that would probably need to be implemented in August and September. Perfect. Well, again, I do want to be respectful of your time, but we cannot thank you enough for joining us here today and for, you know, answering all the questions that came in. Um, Warren, would you like to say a few words as well? 
Yeah, thanks, Molly. Dr. Herman, we, again, we just really appreciate the opportunity to speak with you today and ask questions. We appreciate uh, so much time that you've given us. And we, uh, we wish you all the best in your continued candidacy. And we look forward to working with you if you, uh, if you end up as the next superintendent of TCAPS. And thanks again for the community leaders who were able to join us today, as well as the opportunity from the TCAPS Board of Education. So thanks again, everyone. And we look forward to continuing the conversation. It was very nice to talk with all of you. Thank you so much. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Have a great Thank day, you. everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.